welcome to the uh, next uh, conceptual basis of urology course uh, and today we are going to talk about uh, renal cell carcinoma in young adults uh, which is variously described for people younger than 45 or younger than 40 and even some series they talk about people younger than 30 years so I'm fortunate today that uh, I have with me uh, Mr. Zishan Aslam, who is a consultant urologist with a special interest in kidney cancer and particularly in the kidney cancer of genetic origin. So he'll be there to um, add uh, and ask and uh, take queries and his comments will be really, will be very helpful uh, during the course of clarifying some of the things that we will talk about during this course. So, as we know that the conceptual basis of urology essentially to move uh, our participants from just having knowledge to moving towards comprehension, meaning an ability to understand what they have learned, its application, analysis, synthesis, and be able to evaluate what they have learned. So, we hope that is this common interaction between the delegates, presenters, we are able to clarify some of the concepts and be able to move from knowledge to synthesis and analysis. So today's specific learning objectives uh, is number one, to recognize difference in renal masses in young adults compared to the uh, older adults. So anyone under 45 years of age versus those who are elder than 45 years of age. So we need to understand the causes of uh, renal cancer or renal carcinoma in these young adults, uh, its treatment, be able to identify the imaging features which can distinguish these tumors. And if there are any specific uh, imaging features, we need to look at these as well. Uh, various associated manifestation of hereditary conditions uh, and be able to define treatment protocol based upon our understanding of these relatively rare cancers. Uh, and then obviously have to devise a follow-up strategy so that these patients undergo regular follow-up. Uh, and we'll talk about why this follow-up is extremely important in this group of patients. So before we proceed, I have three questions for the audience. They can write it on a piece of paper or they can write it uh, in the chat box. Answer to these three questions. Answer is yes or no. Question number one is, or question number A is that age 46 years of age, uh, 46 years and under with renal cancer, patient with multiple bilateral renal masses and patient with a history or suggestive of familial neoplastic syndrome. Should these undergo genetic evaluation? Yes or no? or maybe I don't know. The second question is, is the Bosnia classification of cystic masses is equally effective in von Hippel-Lindau disease? And the third question is, that is three centimeter cutoff, which is frequently used uh, in young adults as a cutoff for surveillance versus <clears throat> active treatment is, is um, applicable to the hereditary leomyomatosis, renal cell carcinoma, or HLRCC. So we already have a uh, few answers and people have actually not said to which question are they saying yes, uh, probably to the first one. Anyhow, it's, it's for your own consumption. Uh, keep it as a record, uh, all three answers, and see if you have not answered correctly any of the question, uh, you are able to do it at the end of this course. So we know that uh, renal cell carcinoma is not a very common cancer. It's about two to 3% of all adult cancers. Uh, uh, but um, the young adult, RCC is even rarer. So about 10% of the RCCs are seen in the younger adults. Uh, but there are certain differences that we need to understand. Number one, they're more likely to have symptoms at presentation. RCC in young adults are typically smaller in size, except for one uh, or two exceptions, more likely to be organ confined. 
It is typically lower tumor grade, less advanced stages, and the uh, the chances of uh, nodal or distant metastasis is, is relatively low. So all these features makes it relatively uh, compared to the el elderly patients uh, indolent cancer. Uh, what are the proportion of clear cell carcinoma? We know that clear cell carcinoma is the commonest uh, adult renal type of renal cancer. Uh, it is also the commonest uh, tumor seen in the young adults but uh, its proportion is relatively less. So about 90% of older adults have uh, clear cell carcinoma, whereas about 70% uh, or even less have clear cell carcinoma. So there are so many other varieties of cancers. We do see a relatively higher proportion of chromophobe RCC collecting that carcinomas and other rarer types of uh, cancers that we will uh, talk about. So, uh, as we said that it's a relatively uncommon disease, uh, there are histological similarities to the renal cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma of the kidney, but then there are certain unique clinical pathological differences uh, in, the, in the renal cell cancer of the, of the younger adults. The MIT family translocation RCC is, is one example of, of uh, this clinical pathological difference something that you probably would see very infrequently in the elderly population, but you would see uh, relatively frequently among younger adults. <clears throat> it's a rare familial syndrome. Uh, it usually presents with advanced stage disease, poor clinical outcome. There are a lot of tumors which are unclassified RCCs, which are recognized among the uh, younger patients. And uh, the 2022 WHO classification system of the renal tumors have taken into account the various molecular and uh, phenotypical features as well to give new classification or new names to these cancers. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the papers published uh, quite recently. In over 70 cases of young adult RCCs, they have noted that uh, about 50%, just under 50% are clear cell cancers. But there are certain other varieties. The translocation RCC, there are unclassified types, then papillary type one and type two chromophobe RCC. The succinate dehydrogenase uh, deficient RCC uh, and medullary carcinoma. So these are some of the rarer tumors which you would hardly see in the adult population. And some of these are relatively frequently seen in younger patients. Now, this is an interesting <clears throat> paper uh, published uh, some years back, data collected between 1998 to 2011. So 13 years of national cancer base was analyzed and they identified over three and a half thousand patients uh, with, uh, who were younger than 30 years of age and had renal cancer. They further subclassified these uh, groups into those who are younger than uh, 15 years. Uh, there were 161 of these in this series. And those who are between 15 and 21 years, uh, 337 cases. The rest were older than 21 years of age, but younger than 40 years of age, uh, younger than 30 years of age. And uh, they were over 3,000. So majority of renal cell cancers are detected and treated among younger adults between 20 and 30 years. There's a high proportion of younger patients compared to those of uh, 21 to 30 years age group who had RCC of unspecified type and papillary histology. Looking further into this database, one can see that younger patients presented with higher stage, higher grade, and larger tumor size. So as I've said, that since there are there is no huge database anywhere, we, we look into various series and we find uh, some authors have, have concluded that they are not aggressive depending upon what kind of tumors that they are seeing. So in this series, they noted that uh, that Patients who are younger, meaning that they are 
uh, under 15 uh, years of uh, age, they are more frequently have more aggressive cancers. But if you your cancer is diagnosed between 21 and 30 years of age, it is likely to be less aggressive. The lymph node uh, dissection and chemotherapy as a first line treatment was also more frequently observed in the in the younger age population, younger than 21 years of age. Uh, the in the uh, logistic regression analysis, the authors found that stage four presentation children who had government insurance compared to private insurance, non-chromophobe, indicating that access to the medical uh, treatment, non-chromophobe pathology, and patients who undergo first-line chemo, uh, first-line systemic therapy rather than surgery are the indicators of poor prognosis in these children. Now we know that as, as urologists, we are heavily dependent upon uh, imaging and our diagnosis and particularly for renal cancers, uh, uh, imaging is the cornerstone of diagnosis. Uh, vast majority would not require any form of histological diagnosis. And you can go ahead and uh, make a treatment plan based upon the CT and MRs. But the CT has to be done with a certain protocol. So the typical CT algorithm for renal tumor is that there should be one unenhanced picture or series and uh, three phase contrast. So corticomedullary, nephrogenic, nephrographic, and delayed phases is that is what is required for a, if uh, the CT has already been done, but not with the renal protocol, and the plan is to do partial nephrectomy, then an arterial phase, nephrographic phase, and an excretory phase CT with coronal and sagittal reconstruction, is that is what is required. So if you have a patient who had a CT scan, but it's not optimum to, make, uh, to help you make a decision, you probably would be uh, planning to do a pep, uh, partial nephrectomy, then specifically write to the radiologist that they should do an arterial nephrographic and excretory phase films with coronal and sagittal reconstruction. For patients who've got a locally advanced cancer in which uh, local advanced disease or metastatic disease is uh, is likely, then these patients should undergo a portal venous phase and a late arterial phase surveillance as well, because these are the two phases which can pick up cancers, local metastases, and involvement of the pancreas, liver, etc. So uh, these are some of the finer things which will help you in making a good diagnosis before you intervene. The second question is that since uh, in the adults, we have seen a transition which West has seen over two decades back, that majority of our renal cancers are diagnosed in the uh, as an incidental tumors uh, because of the ultrasound or CT done for something else. So it's not a very infrequent that you do a non-contrast CT for flank pain, suspicion of stone disease, and you find these lesions, and these lesions like uh, uh, the one that you see on the left side of the picture, and then there's another one which is relatively more complex. And you have to make a decision what kind of further imaging is needed, if at all, because these are very frequently seen observations. And if it is required, what kind of imaging is required. So tumor of any size, with the uh, homogeneous low attenuation, meaning less than 20 ounce field unit on a non-contrast CT. Those which are small tumors, like less than one centimeter, uh, with the uh, greater than 20 ounce field unit uh, attenuation, and those homogeneous hyper attenuating tumors, which have attenuation of uh, more than 70 uh, ounce field unit, are likely to be benign cysts. So they don't typically need any further imaging. However, if you have a, a lesion identified on non-contrast CT with fat, uh, less than 10 Hounsfield unit and calcification, maybe something like this, 
uh, attenuation between greater than 20 or less than 70 in any part, and heterogeneous uh, tumor with septa, wall thickening, mural nodules, or calcification. These are likely to be malignant tumors, and they should be further investigated according to the uh, protocol that we have just talked about. Similarly, uh, non -co uh, contrast enhanced CTs are sometimes done, and they would also identify patients who've got lesions, renal masses, which cannot be categorized because the CT was not done with the renal protocol. So uh, you need to you need to be careful what kind of uh, tumor you're looking at, mass that you're looking at, and there are certain masses which probably would uh, just be categorized as a benign cyst and would not require any further imaging. Heterogeneous without fat, greater than uh, less than 10 ounce field unit uh, with calcification uh, and hyper attenuating tumors masses would require uh, have a raise a high degree of suspicion for malignancy and they should be further investigated by um, contrast enhanced renal protocol ct scans so one of the algorithms that is proposed uh, by the authors says that if you have a renal mass, no enhancement, uh, it's likely to be cystic. Mac my microscopic fat, which is minus 20 ounce field unit, angiolipoma. And if there is an enhancement without fat, it's likely to be RCC. Can the RCC be further classified on a CT scan based upon the kind of enhancement and the pattern that we see? Well, if it is equivocal between 10 and 20 ounce field units, uh, it is likely to be papillary or a chromophobe tumor. If it is mild enhancement, it is likely to be an RCC of the papillary subtypes too. And if it is high enhancement, the typical clear cell carcinoma is what is suspected. And we'll talk in a little bit detail about uh, these lesions subsequently. So, this is a CT scan, and uh, 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 you know, as you can see, that there is a mass lesion, which is heterogeneous peripheral contrast enhancement, very similar to the renal cortex. Uh, this is a clear cell, renal cell carcinoma, grade two. Uh, it has a very alveolar sort of uh, uh, enhancement, and you can see that between the uh, corticomedullary and the nephrographic phase, there are some changes uh, in this. Uh, and this is what typically the clear cell cancer looks like of a grade two Furman. This lesion um, is again well circumscribed. It is um, showing peripheral enhancement uh, with nodular enhancement as well. And as you can see that the red arrow is indicating these nodular enhancement uh, with hypo attenuating areas in the in the center as well. And this is a low grade Furman one uh, renal cell carcinoma. This is another interesting uh, CT scan. And if you look closely, uh, the in the uh, corticomedullary phase there is diffuse enhancement of this lesion, very similar to the enhancement that you see of the renal cortex. And there is a central scar in the, in the middle. If you move to the um, nephrographic phase, you see that the uh, enhancement in the solid area of the tumor is less, whereas there is uh, the central scar is still persistent. So, this is this is a typical appearance of a multicentric chromophobe RCC. So these are some of the subtle things, which uh, and and we are actually these are all CT scan of uh, young adults, and um, it is it is possible to differentiate various types of tumor even before the histology is available. A very similar lesion, and uh, you can see that the uh, uh, peripheral enhancement is like the renal cortex uh, with the presence of a, a non-enhancing central scar, which is indicated by the red arrow here. 
And uh, it is both the same in the nephrographic as well as in the corticomedullary phase. And this is an oncocytoma uh, related to the Bet Hog Dube syndrome. Okay, so what about uh, cystic RCCs in young adults? And we know that Bosnia classification is the mainstay of stratifying complex cystic masses into category one to four. And, uh, and this has served nicely among adults. And we are able to uh, distinguish benign from malignant conditions. However, there is a caution, and this was one of the questions that I asked initially, is that the applicability of the Bosnia classification uh, is not as good in the in the RCC in BHL, uh, the von Hippel Lindau disease, as well as in the hereditary leiomyomatosis RCC. So one should be very careful in those two conditions, the Bosnia classification does not hold. Well, it has been proposed, uh, at least in, in the older adults, to use MRI scan in this. Uh, and uh, it has been described that you can you follow a certain algorithm and you can determine the, the chances of clear cell. So this is called CCLS, which is a clear uh, cell likelihood score. Uh, it has not so far been validated among young adults. Uh, the kidney biopsy is generally not recommended by the EU and EU guidelines, uh, particularly in, in certain conditions, particularly BHD. So this is, uh, I borrowed this slide from RSNA, uh, and uh, this is the MRI scan for determining the CCLS, which is clear cell likelihood score. Now what you do is you do an MRI MRI scan, which is an in-phase MRI T1 weighted image. As you can see here, the voxel in a in-phase uh, MRI scan essentially looks at both the water and the fat, and it gives you a mean value. So it would not be able to, um, to dis distinguish between the two. So each voxel that you placed anywhere in T1 weighted in-phase MRI scan would only give you a cumulative value. Now, if you do uh, a post-phase t one weighted uh, image in, um, in, in this patient, you will find that the, the fat uh, is separated and you'll be able to determine what was the decrease in the mean values um, of attenuation in these patients. And that would give you some idea about uh, whether there is a likelihood of a clear cell pathology or not. Okay, so let's move on from imaging to genetics. And uh, I've got a couple of questions for you in the next slide. And uh, I would like you to take a piece of pencil and paper and, and write your answers. Uh, and uh, we will then tell you the correct answers and you can mark yourself. So you have four conditions on the left hand of the slide and four possibilities. So you need to match say A1 or B3 or D4, whatever. So you can mark your answers on a piece of paper and then I'll tell you the correct answer. Okay, the correct answer is, uh, this is important uh, just to <clears throat> jog up your old memory about genetics, because we get to talk about a little bit about genetic transmission of some of these uh, conditions which are responsible for young adult RCC. So the correct answer is uh, A2, B4, C3, and D1. So you can mark yourself and if there is any error, please correct yourself uh, before we move on to the next uh, 
This is a very famous diagram that you guys may have seen in various papers about uh, various uh, hereditary conditions or genetic alterations or mutations which can result in RCC. The von Hippel Lindau disease is very well known, uh, which is because of the VHL gene. Uh, and it typically results in uh, clear cell cancers. The bet hogg uh, dube syndrome, again, it's a very typical condition, uh, not a very frequent thing, but it has a genetic transmission with uh, the folliculin gene. The tuberous sclerosis uh, complex results in angiomyolipomas. The PHTS, which is due to the P10, uh, gene alteration and which results in the XP11.2 renal cell cancers are also some of the examples. Uh, this is the follow-up strategy. Uh, how would you keep uh, following these young adults on a regular basis? Because various conditions, various diseases have a different pattern and their uh, prognostic potential. So some are quite aggressive some are relatively indolent. So you need to stratify your follow-up strategy accordingly. Over about 120 years back, uh, a German uh, ophthalmologist, uh, Eugen von Kippel, uh, described the retinal angiomas. And uh, subsequently, Dr. Arnold Lindau a Swedish uh, pathologist uh, in, in an autopsy studies noted um, hemangioblastoma of the of cerebellar hemangioblastomas. And uh, they described this condition subsequently as uh, one hepa Lindau disease. It is seen in one in 34,000 births. Uh, it is typically a germline mutation in the VHL gene in over about 95% cases. Uh, the de novo and, and um, the mosaicism is something which is uh, infrequently observed. So typically, person who has VHL has a germline mutation. Uh, there are various conditions. Um, I'm sure most of you know that. That there could be uh, renal uh, tract issues like RCCs and pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas that we directly deal with. And there could be other conditions related to pancreatic cyst and endocrine tumors of the pancreas, the hemangioblastomas of the central nervous system and retina, et cetera. Uh, this is the description of this gene and, and the downstream pathways, which essentially made the breakthrough in our understanding and ability to uh, devise the systemic treatment for renal cell cancers. So patients uh, with VHL uh, or gene mutation are at a lifetime risk of uh, developing about 40 to 60% chances of developing uh, con uh, synchronous or metachronous uh, renal cell cancers. Typically, they are clear cell cancers. Typically, they are multiple and bilateral, as you can see in, in this uh, cartoon. Right, the other condition is hereditary papillary renal cell carcinoma type one, which is a more aggressive variant of uh, hereditary papillary cancer. It uh, is uh, caused by the uh, genetic alterations. Multiple and bilateral papillary type one cancers are seen in younger patients. Um, again, it is because of the germline mutation in the mesothelial epid uh, epididymal uh, um, uh, of gene, which uh, results in um, uh, development of these cancers. Uh, they are typically uh, germline mutations, but uh, sporadic cases or wild type can also be observed uh, in with trisomy of uh, chromosome seven and mutation of uh, the uh, duplication of the CMET proto-oncogene. The typical treatment of uh, these patients is to target the MET pathway and the MET receptors. And this is done by the MET uh, uh, monoclonal antibody called METMAP. Um, 
it is not very commonly used, but uh, and I'm I'm not sure if it is even available in our part of the world. Another condition which can result in a significantly aggressive uh, cancer is the hereditary leomyomatosis with RCC or HLRCC. Now, what exactly happened is that in this type of uh, gene alteration, you have leomyomas, uterine fibroids, pheochromocytoma and pangaragangliomas along with the RCC. And the RCC is typically a, a type 2, which is fumarate hydri hydratase deficient RCC. Now, what really happens is that in the presence of functional fumarate hydratase, a hypoxia-inducible factor is degraded. We know that uh, in conditions of hypoxia, the HIF becomes active. It causes uh, growth factor and uh, angioneogenesis to apply more, to supply more oxygen. And once the normaxia is achieved, this becomes deactive. And for this, we need to have FH uh, working nicely. Now, if the FH is, is not working optimally, there will be accumulation of fumarate and uh, uh, low levels of malate because all malate will be converted into fumarate. Now, once the malate becomes uh, deficient, the Krebs cycle, which is anaerobic glycolysis, becomes activated. And as a consequence, anaerobic glycolysis, uh, there would be a cascade of event with proliferation, angiogenesis, and subsequently tumorigenesis. So this is, this is the essential mechanism which helped us in our understanding and development of the systemic treatment for renal cell cancer. As I was alluding to earlier, that the TI, uh, TFE3 rearranged, this is the uh, MIT translocation type of renal cancer, which is of two varieties, essentially the TFE3, which result in XP11.2 translocation, RCC, and the TFEB, which results in um, T611 translocation, RCC, uh, relatively rare variety. The ELOC, which is a long uh, gene alteration, can result in the TCB1. So these are some of the uh, rare types of uh, cancers, and these are incorporated in the 2022 version of the WHO classification of renal tumor, which is uh, based upon molecular um, uh, um, diagnosis of these cancers. Okay, this is a 14-year-old female patient with the right-sided translocation MIT uh, renal cell carcinoma. And as you can see in this T2-baked image, that there is hypo-intense lesion, which is irregular, undefined margins, uh, both in the, uh, in the axial and the coronal section of the T2-baked image. If you look at the T1-baked image, there seems to be, uh, again, a relatively high po intense mass and the diffusion weighted images with ADC mapping shows a, a, a low value and all this is basically the um, MIT translocation RCC. Now this is uh, an interesting case uh, incidental single uh, renal mass lesion was identified in a 40 year old male who, has, who is known to have uh, the wet hog dube syndrome. <clears throat> now, if you look at this MRI scan, which is unenhanced MRI, you the arrow is pointing out to a lesion here, which is really not very obvious or not very clear. If you look at the contrast enhanced um, nephrographic phase, you can now see this lesion to be hypo-intense on the T1-weighted image. However, you see another lesion, which is much smaller, which was something which was not visible on the, on the uh, non-contrast MR scan and is now visible here. Uh, again, uh, in the, in the, uh, nephro in the corticomedullary phase, 
uh, of the MR scan, T1 weighted image, these lesions are very clearly seen. They, they look um, multiple and they are um, in one of them, the smaller one is, is about six millimeter. The bigger one was about 1.5 millimeter uh, centimeters. However, uh, the patient underwent um, a metastatic workup and a chest CT showed multiple cysts in the lung. Now, this is very typical of, uh, of Berthog Dubé syndrome. The combination of multiple solid renal neoplasm with characteristic pulmonary cyst uh, is typically oncocytoma in the setting of BHD. Uh, this is a 35-year-old lady who has uh, the tuberous sclerosis um, complex. And you can see that in this axial section, there is a large lesion, which is uh, partly endophytic, partly exophytic. And uh, it has a, a hyper-intense area here where the arrow is pointing out. Now, if you look... Uh, in this uh, uh, nephrographic phase, again, uh, this lesion is, is becoming less hyperintense in the nephrographic phase. This is a typical appearance of, um, of, uh, angioma of angiomyolipoma seen in patients with tuberous sclerosis. Because the lesion was more than four centimeters, uh, she was at wise Evrolimus. And uh, after one year of being on Evrolimus, you can see that the lesion size has decreased, but also it is less intense on contrast enhanced MRI. So uh, Avrolimus has really become the first line treatment and uh, only day before, yes, uh, I think it was last week that I saw this lady who uh, we have been treating for many years. Uh, she is in, his, in her early thirties. TSC with the bilateral angiomyolipomas. Uh, she was a young mother. She got very recently married and uh, she didn't want any surgery. She came with a bleeding episode. We did the angioembolization of one of the bigger lesions at that time. This is about four or five years back. But then um, her symptoms settled down and then we put her on Evrolimus and she's been on Evrolimus uh, for all those years, and her lesions have really been stable. Um, although there is one lesion on the left kidney, which is reported to be more than four centimeters, and uh, there is some discussion about whether she should undergo embolization for that, that lesion or not. But uh, for the time being, I think she's doing well on Evrolimus. Uh, I think she's on two milligrams because her renal functions uh, got deranged. Anyhow. <clears throat> Uh, this is another uh, finding, incidental finding in a 31-year-old male. Uh, what you can see is uh, an ultrasound, a grayscale ultrasound, which shows multiple cysts uh, in, in, in this patient. However, the MR uh, was uh, suspicious of solid lesions. And the MR scan essentially showed that uh, there are multiple uh, hypointense lesions. Uh, similarly, this is another phase of MR scan. Um, the CT scan in this gentleman indicated a big uh, lesion in the, uh, in the uh, mediastinum. And uh, all these things together uh, gives you the diagnosis of uh, succinate dehydrogenase mutation-related RCC. So you have a paraganglioma in the mediastinum. You have multiple um, RCCs within the kidney. And uh, this is uh, the genetic testing confirmed that this is uh, succinate dehydrogenase uh, type of uh, something that he inherited from his father. 32-year-old women with uh, underwent routine imaging surveillance, and you can see that uh, there is an iso-dense uh, lesion uh, on her non-contrast CT. And uh, the contrast in on CT indicated uh, a lesion in the nephrographic phase, which is less dense 
and the renal parenchyma. Uh, these are the MR scans, and uh, you can see in the various phases of uh, T2 weighted image and the T1 weighted image is uh, the the opposed phase and the end phase. Uh, you you can see these lesions very well circumscribed. Now, although it's a simple cyst uh, on all the CT and MR scans, but because of her, of the history and the genetic background, this patient uh, was treated uh, by partial nephrectomy. And this cystic lesion showed uh, a type two papillary renal cell carcinoma, which is something that you see in hereditary leomyomatosis renal cell cancer. And that's why the question initially asked was that for uh, HLRCC and VHL, you should not use the Bosnia classification for cystic lesion um, because uh, the cyst can actually contain RCCs. Uh, for VHL as well, uh, patients have cysts and within these cysts, they develop RCC or that they have uh, normal parenchyma developing. RCC both are known, but says developing RCC is, is, is much more frequently observed. Uh, we, we have talked about this uh, P, P10 hematoma tumor syndrome of PHTS, which is due to um, uh, mutation in the oncogene P10. And this results in various pathological conditions. Uh, uh, there are rarer syndromes and conditions I'm not going to go into the details of this, but essentially uh, these, these patients with P10 mutation uh, have a high risk of developing malignant neoplasms. They also have um, various mental conditions, and this include the autism, uh, autism spectrum disorder, uh, developmental delays, intellectual disability, and uh, the PTN is considered as one of the risk factors for development of ASD, which is autism spectrum disorder. So uh, the, these are neurodevelopmental disorders, which also results from uh, PTN mutation. So these patients uh, can develop cancers in various parts of the body, which include breast cancer, endometrial cancer, thyroid, kidney cancer in about one third of the cases, colorectal carcinomas and melanomas. Uh, so these patients, uh, children who have uh, the neurodevelopmental disorder have a slightly uh, less chances of developing malignancy. Uh, the difference is between 15 and 11%. I don't know if it is really uh, means anything. The XP 11.2 uh, translocation carcinomas we have talked about, and I think because of time, we should uh, uh, not go into the details, but essentially these patients, uh, the prognostic survival in these patients is not very different from adults. Um, and then this large series uh, reported uh, five, six years back uh, in the journal clinical genital urinary cancer, over 8,000 patients from seven institutions were diagnosed with renal cell carcinoma were reviewed. And they've noted that uh, 61 cases of XP11.2 translocation RCC over a period of 10 years. Uh, the mean age was uh, about 38 years. The age of incidence, there were two peaks between 30 and 40 and one later. The mean tumor size was 6.3. And there is a tendency towards more advanced dis stage disease and nodal metastases at the time of diagnosis. So uh, these tumors, which if compared to uh, Kaplan-Meier curve for cancer-specific sur survival, you can see that it is uh, in favor of the clear cell carcinoma, which has a much better survival than uh, the XP11.2 translocation RCC. Another example of, and I think the two or three cases that we have seen in our institution of XP11.2 translocation are again, uh, our personal experience of the small experience 
is again indicative of an highly aggressive cancers um, in which in fact, uh, one of the young adult, I thought it's a Wilms tumor, the way it was crossing the midline with various nodal disease. Uh, however, it came out to be an XP11.2 translocation RCC. And uh, this is uh, this is some of the examples of uh, these lesions. This is XP11.2, large lesion in a 47-year-old female. Um, so XP11.2 translocation RCCs manifest as advanced masses. Uh, they have uh, mild persistent enhancement on CT scan, which is an indication of their diagnosis. Uh, tumor calcification and hemorrhage is also uh, observed. And there is a predilection of, uh, in young adults, uh, clinical features are confirming XP11.2. So you need to be really careful and look at these holistically to be able to identify these genetic alterations. So what are the management options in, in young adults who are identified with uh, renal cell cancers? Well, the uh, characteristics is that they are diagnosed at a younger age. There's a, a greater chance of these tumors recurring and they may be requiring multiple intervention. The principle of care should be nephron sparing, preservation of renal function in these young adults as much as possible with an adequate uh, oncological outcome. Uh, the active surveillance uh, is considered for, and the rule is three centimeters. Anything which is less than three centimeters should be for active surveillance, except in cases of uh, the hereditary leomimetosis, renal cell carcinoma. Um, partial nephrectomy should be the mode of treatment in majority of cases. Uh, thermal ablation, with cryoablation, uh, the radiofrequency ablation, microwave thermotherapy, some of the other options which are available and which are exercised based upon cases. So the question really is that uh, since significant proportion of, of these patients have genetic alterations, once identified, should genetic workup for the rest of the family members be done? And I'm going to, um, um, these are some of the points that we have talked about earlier as well, are some of the indication for doing genetic workup in patients who are identified with, uh, with uh, these kind of tumors. Uh, these are some of the extra renal uh, manifestation of hereditary renal cell cancer. So if your patient has any of these things, <laughs> you should be thinking in terms of hereditary renal cell carcinoma and genetic makeup is indicated. I'm going to share a little video, a two minute video. Um, this is from the Loyola University in the United and States. I've been having a series of uh, lung issues. I first met Deborah in January of 2020. The fact that her brother had had a pneumothorax and that she had a diagnosis of cystic lung disease made me wonder if this was some sort of inherited or genetic type disease. I thought maybe she could have berthog dubay disease, which is an inherited genetic disease, but the way you make that diagnosis is through the help of a genetic counselor. Ultimately, she underwent genetic counseling and genetic testing and was identified to carry a genetic change in the FLCN gene and confirmed a diagnosis of berthog dubay And he did explain the whole situation of how BHD will affect my life and uh, I was uh, doing a lot of research on my own, and I was concerned for my daughters. Because we know Berthog Dubay follows an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance, we knew that Deborah's daughter, Christy, had a 50% chance to also have Berthog Dubay, which is ultimately why she underwent genetic testing as well. When she tested and the results came back that she had it, I gave her Dr. Dilling's number, and I said, make an appointment with him. The most important thing to know about Berthog Dubay disease, and the reason it's so important to know that you have it, is so that you can be on the lookout with your doctors for the development of kidney cancer. So I went and got the MRI done, and they found that I had the kidney tumor, and it was about the size of a grapefruit. I immediately called Dr. Gupta, who's a specialist in genetic forms of kidney cancer. 
I told her some of the good news that I didn't see any evidence that it had spread anywhere to the lungs, to the lymph nodes. And I told her that, you know, what we're going to have to do is surgically remove this and get her back on her feet. And she was in the right place and we we're going to take great care of her. It was uh, a kidney cancer. It was consistent with her Burt Hog Dubé. She wouldn't need any further therapies at this time. If she hadn't found this disease when she found it, this kidney tumor would have grown. It would have spread. I love my mom and I'm, I'm grateful that she pushed me to... Since then I've been... So... Essentially, uh, this is this is an ideal situation, but unfortunately, even in the in the Western countries, and I will ask uh, Zishan about uh, what really happens in UK. Uh, not all healthcare setups uh, uh, allow genetic testing in all situations, um, and um, even I think there are issues about the BRCA gene uh, analysis in the family members. Uh, which we know that uh, has a very strong relationship with breast cancer and aggressive type of breast cancers. Uh, so uh, I was reading this uh, review published in European Urology Focus three, four years back, and uh, they've also talked about the uh, situation in Europe and US about uh, the health agencies allowing genetic uh, testing. So I don't know when it, and how it will appear and available in our part of the world. Um, with this, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would uh, invite uh, Mr. Zishan Afzal Aslam to please come and uh, share some of his experience in managing these things and if he has any observations. Zishan. Thank you very much for, for inviting and thank you so much for such a fantastic review of uh, this very, very interesting uh, topic uh, and it, i think it's very very useful for the exams and for the residents as well uh, so yeah this is uh, clearly uh, the rising incidence of kidney cancer uh, which in itself is a dilemma then bilateral tumors and then a further dilemma is the younger patients that we come across and uh, when it comes to managing these uh, patients clearly one of the approaches is as as it's been indicated that they, there is a tendency that these cancers could be more aggressive uh, compared to our conventional uh, kidney cancers that we see in, in our elderly population. Uh, so uh, a slightly more aggressive approach uh, is, uh, is, is this what we adopt. Um, like for example, tumors which are usually cut off sub three centimeter going into treatment, uh, but in a younger population, even when it's just crossing two centimeter, then we, we would start looking into uh, treating that. Uh, biopsy is not something which we, uh, again, consider here, which uh, your, your lecture has mentioned about guidelines not recommending that either, because, again, youngish population, um, even if the biopsy is negative, they go on surveillance, but the, but the problem is how long the surveillance, because if, he, if the patient is 40, even after five-year protocol, they would still be 45, and we cannot really discharge them. Uh, same with what kind of nephron sparing approach uh, we adopt uh, but like ablations is a, is a different kind of ablations cryoablation uh, radio frequency they are giving good outcomes but again we tend to avoid that uh, when it comes to uh, surgical approaches uh, as you may have all experienced um, with uh, with uh, kidney cancers that smaller well uh, well confined cancers they ha they have a very good outcome with uh, enucleation but here we tend to just go with excision uh, of the lesion with a with a reasonable margin because again a tendency to have aggressive cancer um, and another thing here uh, coming to the your last slide about the genetic counseling uh, then clearly um, all these young patients who are and usually the cutoff is around 45 years uh, not just them, but small uh, bilateral tumors um, or multiple tumors, even in elderly, they all go for genetic counseling. Uh, and then uh, if, it, if they're positive, then uh, the, the other family members, uh, the first degree relatives, uh, the immediate family, they go through genetic counseling as well. And then uh, pro according to protocol, they can consider uh, imaging as well. Uh, another thing which we often come across in these tumors is the the kind of uh, unclassified tumors. 
Uh, and that is something again, uh, which is uh, more common in these youngish population with multi, and especially with multiple bilateral compared to, uh, again, the conventional scenario. Uh, but our pathologist advice is always that to, to consider them as high grade, grade four disease, just in the category of uh, the ones where this sarcomatoid differentiation or abdoid differentiation, which are as aggressive as you can, as you can get. And I would really, uh, mention a very quickly a case, uh, a patient about late 40s who had these bilateral tumors, multiple, um, and which I did stage, stage partial nephrectomy bilaterally, about four or five tumors removed from each kidney. And he turned out to have a smart B1 gene uh, deletion. Um, uh, and that was something which I had not uh, known until that point, it was 2018, I think. And he managed to, the next four years, only one of the remaining many tumors got bigger to two centimeter, uh, where we did an ablation on him uh, because it was very endophytic. Um, but eventually, four, uh, uh, four years later, he developed a very advanced esophageal cancer uh, and he passed away because of that. So another factor is there's a, while there's a lot known, there's still a things that are uh, unknown with regards to these, these uh, um, genetic cancers. So this is this is usually the approach we are uh, adopting. They are more aggressive approach towards these patients. Thank you, Zushan. Um, Thank you. I think uh, if there are any questions or any observation or comments, or somebody would like to share their experience uh, in in this disease, please feel free to raise your hand or write in the check box. We still have a few minutes before nine o'clock. Okay, um, right, uh, so I don't see any hands raised. Oh, there is one, uh, yes. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, Jeev. Uh, please go ahead. Okay. Is he mute or let's have a quick? I don't know who, who has raised the hand. Uh, can't. Dr. Ayaz, um, I think he's. Dr. Ayaz. Uh, Ayaz, you want to say something? Uh, okay, right. Um, yes, have you have hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, Ayaz, please. Can you hear me? G, please proceed. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Uh, uh, excellent presentation, Dr. Hamad. Uh, it was a very excellent review. Uh, I just wanted to know, you know, because we are, you know, uh, uh, now and uh, then we are getting these multiple tumors and uh, these uh, syndromes. Do we have any genetic testing uh, facility available here in Pakistan? Do we have in Afghanistan? Because we don't have it here. And uh, if not, what should we do about these patients? Uh, the, the next generation sequencing is available at AKU. Uh, I have not been able to utilize that service, so I don't know much about it. Uh, we have one pediatric uh, pediatrician who has an interest in, um, in genetic dis conditions, and he does uh, specific clinics for uh, genetic disorders, and he's the one who is uh, managing that NGS. Uh, but I don't think it's very frequently used. You're right. Uh, Yes. Um, I think uh, for some of the conditions I know for BRCA, they sent specimen outside Pakistan. So um, probably the service is patchy at the moment or they're not able to uh, entertain everyone. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's expensive as well. Yeah. But I think we should we should have some lies on, you know, because... Uh... I mean, like if we are thinking of forming some registry in the future, especially yeah. in these genetic uh, um, issues, so I, I, I don't know, but how, how to go about it, you know, throughout the country, we have multiple cases and how to manage these things because we, we have to start up some some this genetic testing in our yeah. part of the world. If I think it's a good have... idea. What we can do is to invite uh, this gentleman uh, to our... Uh, annual conference or this forum to talk about various genetic disorders 
related to the urinary tract. And uh, I think we can address some of these questions at that forum. Cool. That's going to be great. Thank you very much for your thank comments you. and observation, Ayaz. And thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zishan Aslam. And uh, you've been very, uh, I think your practical experience in this regard is, is really something we have benefited from. So, and thank you for all the all, uh, audience. Uh, see you next month with a new CBU. Until then, the office. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosishan. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much.